This month is Camera Modification Month. One of the reasons I got into machining was to muck around with modifying uh, camera equipment. Now, back in the day when Polaroid um, film was easily available, I really had no interest in it. But as things turn out, once it became no longer available, that sort of caught my attention. Now, Polaroid made some incredibly cool cameras. This is a Polaroid 250, which was a classic land camera. I mean, how cool is this, huh? What a great piece, piece of industrial design and engineering. Uh, this is only the 250. It's, uh, it's only got the, the sort of crappy 1960s automatic electronic uh, exposure. Um, but at least it's got a focusing system and a very cool uh, range finder from, from Zeiss. Now, film was available for these, or I guess film still is available for these, but it's all life expired now because Fuji stopped uh, manufacturing the last types of peel apart film a few years ago. The only film of similar size still available is uh, Fuji's Instax, um, which is a, not a bad film. It's just unfortunate that Fuji doesn't make any decent cameras for it. They make the nowadays the 310, this is a 210, um, point and shoot, auto everything, no manual control, uh, crappy plastic lenses, nothing, nothing too impressive here. Uh, the only manufacturer of a, of a decent camera for Instax wide film is the Mint RF70, but I can't afford one. So how do I get this film to work in this camera? with a better lens. The film packs are of somewhat similar size. This was a film pack from, uh, from the old Land Peel Apart, I think it was a Fuji 100C or one of those sort of films. And this is the, uh, the Instax film pack. The photos are roughly the same width, but the pack films from Polaroid and Fuji were about nearly a centimeter uh, taller the photo. However the big difference and that what makes, which makes it so difficult to uh, to modify this one camera to the other is on the Fuji the film ejects out through the top. On pack film the film was pulled out to the side and that of course has an effect on the whole design of the camera. A Polaroid camera had this uh, slot on the side for the, where the film got, used to be pulled out and on top we have the rangefinder and its magnet to hold it into position. On the Fuji the top of the camera has the um, film ejection slot and the crappy viewfinder is off onto the side. The other thing is this side of the Fuji has got its battery compartment which the tab broke so that's now uh, taped up and in here is the is the drive motor or to eject the film so let's take a closer look at the parts of a Fuji Instax wide camera that you actually need for a retrofit in that case I've got it down really to two major components this is the film back which has got the spring loading to push make to make sure that the film gets pushed forward onto the film gate. And you can see I've used some automotive body filler or bog to fill up the unnecessary slots. This will then get painted and be ready for use. If you look at some other videos of people pulling apart and, and hacking uh, Instax wide cameras, this is the internal plastic component. Um, it carries the two steel rollers which squeeze the film as it comes out, breaking open the pod of chemicals and distributing them across the photo. So this is one of the major features of the camera. Off on this side there was a drive mechanism with an electric motor and some batteries to drive these rollers and drive the film out. And the final feature that's still important is down here there's a lever which grips the photo and kicks it up to start that ejection process. 
the motor is placed in such a horrible angle, it's, it's just not very convenient to reuse it. So my idea is to keep the rollers with their spring loading, manually drive them as the Lomography Bellier did, and just use an, a manual, manual push-up switch to start the, uh, the film ejection, which is once again what the Lomography Bellier back did. And here is a um, here is a Polaroid 100 land camera stripped down, ready for ready to be mated up to that back. The major problem you have with trying to do do this retrofit is if you look at this focus mechanism, all of the components, these lever arms, run in channels both at the top and the bottom of the camera. Just drop that down. which from the back are seen as such. This is the top channel and there is the bottom channel. And you can see that those channels where the, f the focus arm move is, is the, the top one's about nine millimeters behind the uh, film gate and the bottom one is about two and a half millimeters behind the film gate. Comparing the two film packs, in each case, the focal plane of the film is about one millimeter behind the reference surface, which will sit up against the, the, the gate of the camera. That's roughly the same on for both packs, roughly a millimeter. The film pack for the from Fuji for Instax actually fits quite snugly into the back of a Polaroid land camera. So at one level there are some possibilities to actually do this however inserted like that the slot where the film comes out is pretty much flush with the, the top of that channel where the, the focus mechanism and the lens mount arms are moving. So placing the film into the, the plastic carrier which would normally have uh, rollers, the squeegee rollers fitted you can see that those rollers will interfere with the location of the lens mount rail here okay. so with doing nothing else but locating lens case mounting unit to the back of a land camera is going to push the focal plane back 15 to 20 millimeters so what other options are there? A second option would be to turn it around and put, and put the film in upside down. This will have the, the disadvantage that the, the white strip will be then at the top of every photo rather than at the bottom. To fit that film pack upside down in the land camera, then we would then need to mill away those ribs across here and we will still have a have the film plane at about two and a half millimeters further back than it was originally. Once you mill away those channels which includes the tripod mount and this part of the part of the bottom channel you could then insert the pack such that the whole roller mechanism hangs out the bottom of the, the camera. So this way we could move the focal plane to within two and a half millimeters of its original position. We need to make a spacer to go around the film gate. This does have a second issue in that once you move the, the rollers below the camera, the piece of film is no longer centered in the film gate. You can see that? The picture taking area will be displaced towards the top of the photo. Given that the Instax film is narrower in height than the, than the original pack film, the viewfinder's frame is not going to be accurate without modification anyway. A third method of mounting Instax into a land camera body would be to separate the functions of the film holder and the film gate and the drive mechanism. So basically cut the whole drive mechanism off, install the film gate portion 
so that the film's held roughly in its uh, in the position of the original pack film, and then have re rebuilt the roller system to sit above the focus mechanism and uh, lens holding channel. Uh, that would require then a further mod modification to remove the mount points for the t swiveling viewfinder and raise the viewfinder above the above the film processing unit where you probably actually have to flick the the viewfinder down each time you want to process a photo. In the best case scenario this should be able to put the film almost on the original film plane. It will require some pretty serious uh, modification to put the the film processing unit into place above the existing rail and also will still require some way of operating this kick-out mechanism which will then be down on this side. I think for this first hack I'm going to go for the simplest possible solution or the simplest of those three solutions in which will be mounting the film upside down. So what I'll do next will be to mill away these two ribs and the portion of the tripod socket. I'll 3D print a spacer and epoxy that into place to bring the film gate up to the level of the, the lower rail and then epoxy the whole back mechanism into place. Since I'll be milling these away I'm just going to cover all of the bellows area with some uh, tape to stop the worst of the swarf getting into the into the bellows. The forces on this are only going to be very light. We're only cutting away the aluminium down to that uh, that level here. Um, so a bit off the bottom that front rib and half of the tripod boss. This is only a rough and ready first attempt at a prototype. I'm not going to bother writing a toolpath for it. I'm just going to jog the machine around to take off this, uh, this small amount of metal. I'll start by touching off in Z down in this corner and then just, just uh, manually move around taking off all of this material. Well that was a pretty good demonstration of why you shouldn't use a CNC mill as a manual mill. I totally screwed up there and punched a hole through this spot. Luckily it's uh, not critical. It's just the where the lens mount lever arm lives once it's uh, fully extended. This old Polaroid 100 was never in a very good condition and I've just realized that the rivet which mounts this focus arm was broken off so I'm probably going to have to drill it out and make a new pivot to su support the lens mount arm. I printed up a spacer 3.3 millimeters thick to bring the film gate up to a single level. I uh, need a little bit of a rebate here because this is where the the film kick out mechanism moves and it needed a little bit of space. Next step, mix up some JB Weld with a little bit of laser printer toner and make it nice and black and glue this into place. The epoxy is now dried and you can see how the spacer I've added shows where the film cutout will be and you can see how it's offset 
the image will be upside down so it's offset up from the center line of the lens. Something we'll have to address later when we play around with the um, viewfinder. The next task is to reassemble the development rollers and then epoxy the film holder into the camera. So the next thing is to reassemble the development rollers. The two rollers are not the same. They have different size slots for the drive cogs. There's this little spacer which holds the two rollers apart. That needs to be inserted at the back. Luckily when I took the, the roller assembly apart I did take a number of photos which helps me put it back together again. So the spacer goes down into a slot here. These are the features that would make it difficult to completely remanufacture this um, this assembly, you know, you need these these quite small features, um, which would be difficult to machine in aluminium, uh, as opposed to this, which is of course a moulded part. The next piece are these little caps. Once again, they fit into little slots. There's a slot here and a slot here, and these are which the springs act against. So that's the first one in place. So it now gets retained by a spring, which needs to go over that little tab. And down under there. Retaining that spring with a with a screw, extremely fine thread into plastic, doesn't strike me as a terribly robust method of retention. That's something you'd probably have to redesign. Here you can see the end of the rollers. Hmm. When I ripped into this and took off all of the plastic features, I was unsure whether to leave this this rail here. I wasn't sure what the, the purpose of this uh, slot is. Um, it'll ha obviously have to be covered because this is the emulsion side of the photo which comes up through into the rollers here. So you can't have light going through this part. For this build, I've left this rail in place. But when you look closely, that was probably unnecessary. If I'd ground away that rail, I probably could have moved the whole moved the whole frame, uh, photo frame another four or five millimeters towards the center in this direction. I guess on the next the next build I do, that'll be part of the plan is to move that f further over. So we'll be once again mixing up some JB weld weld with some toner. So the first bit's just fixing a little defect. I knocked off this back door spring at some stage. I've been sort of planning to do this this modification, this Instax Roid for at least a couple of years, but I keep getting I guess analysis paralysis where I'd be trying to optimize and perfect the de perfect the design in my head. Um, sometimes you just got to get stuck in and make a prototype, see how things actually work in practice, and then make a second version later. I've made two closeout panels. This bit chopped out of the old back of the uh, Polaroid 100 and out a piece of aluminium, a second closeout panel. So I need to glue these into place now. As JB World with laser toner turns kind of grey, I'm trying it this time with a clear araldite. Uh, 
I'm making good progress here on the easy side. I've closed in the edge of the um, Instax back and butchered a piece of the original um, Polaroid back, glued that into place. Still need to close off this end piece. But I've also started work on the more difficult side, which is the side which is going to need the drive mechanism, which will go here, and also the, the kick out mechanism, which needed a window through here. Now the drive mechanism is going to look something like this. I'll glue this in place first, this, this closeout panel, and then I'll start working on the actual gearing and wind lever to drive the uh, drive rollers. The second thing I'll need to do is make up some, some, some form of an external lever to pick up on this, this internal kicker. So I think that's enough for this episode. Um, got quite a lot done, still a lot to go. Um, if you like what you see, please subscribe, hit the bell, and you'll be the first to know when the next episode gets put up.